So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the University of Huddersfield School of Applied Sciences in conversation with public lectures. This evening we have a lecture from Professor Martin Richards, but before we move on to that, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to go through just to explain to you how the system works here. So there's two different systems you could be on. You could either be on Teams on the web or you could be on the, the Teams app. So the, the way it's going to work is that Martin is going to um, present a lecture. During that lecture, you're more than welcome to ask questions by putting them in the chat. So if you click on that little icon, you can open the chat. So during the whole thing, you're, you're more than welcome to add questions. And so when, when Martin has finished speaking, um, then what we'll do is we'll take a look at those questions and we will do one or two things. We can either pass them on ourselves to Martin or you can raise your hand, um, which you can do during the discussion at the end. And if you want to ask a question yourself, you can raise your hand and you can do so by switching on your microphone and your camera, which will give you access to do at the time. So you'll be on mute um, during the lecture. And then at the end, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and we can put your microphone and your camera on and then you can ask it. Or if you're feeling a little bit shy, then what you can do is put it in the chat and we will pass the question on to Martin for you. So these lectures are meant to be in conversation with. Um, so we would like you to ask as many questions as you want to. Um, and that's the whole point of it is meant to be interactive. So we do hope that you will put questions in the chat as we go along through the evening. So just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded for publication online. We will assume anybody who contributes via camera or microphone is happy to be included in the recording. Um, and so we just need to let you let you know that before we begin. So moving on to our talk this evening, it's time to introduce our speaker. Uh, Martin Richards is Professor of Archaeogenetics at the University of Huddersfield in the UK. He studied genetics at the universities of Sheffield and Manchester, moving into archaeogenetic research at the University of Oxford in 1990. He subsequently moved to UCL, then the University of Huddersfield, then the University of Leeds, and finally back to Huddersfield in 2012 to take up a research chair in archaeogenetics. His research with colleagues from across the world, especially Portugal, Italy, Spain, Germany, America, and within the UK, has particularly sought to apply mitochondrial genome variation to archaeogenetic questions, such as the route taken by modern humans dispersing out of Africa and the settlement of Southeast Asia and the Pacific, most recently returning to the controversy over the settlement of Europe, with a broadening focus to take in genome-wide variation and paleogenetics with a purpose-built DNA facility here at the University of Huddersfield. He co-edited Mitochondrial DNA and the Evolution of Homo Sapiens with Hans Jürgen Van Delt and Vincent McCauley. And since 2015, he's run a Leverhulme doctoral scholarship program in evolutionary genomics entitled Genetic Journeys into History, the Next Generation, here in the School of Applied Sciences at the University of Huddersfield. So that's an introduction to Martin. Now I'm going to hand over to Martin for his talk, but please do remember during the presentation, do put your questions in the chat and then we can ask them directly to Martin at the end, or you can raise your hand and ask them yourself. So over to you, Martin. Right, OK. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Um, OK, so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor, I hope, of what's been going on in the archaeogenetics of Britain in, in the last few years. But uh, to do that, I need to do quite a bit of context. Uh, so that's how I'm going to start. Um, I'll firstly just to. Just to give you a quick definition of archaeogenetics, it's been described as the application of molecular genetics to the study of the human past. And uh, at least for the research that I do, that's especially reconstructing the dispersal history of mankind from the out of Africa migrations through to things that have happened only in the last few hundred years, perhaps. Um, and until about 15 years ago or so, we did this almost entirely from uh, DNA from uh, living populations, so making inferences working back from the variation that we see today. But as you may be aware, nowadays it's it's largely done from ancient DNA, which has really taken off in the last 15 years or so. 
So I'm going to start um, actually out in the Alps with um, Ertzi the Iceman, who was a very famous figure 30 years ago, just just after I, I started working in this area. And um, he was found in the Italian Alps, as you may know, uh, by hikers in 1991, nearly created a diplomatic incident between Austria and Italy, as he was right on the border between the two, and has ended up, um, after a lot of wrangling over the years, in um, Bolzano in northern Italy at a museum there. It's uh, He was a basically a freeze-dried mummy, a late Neolithic mum, or Copper Age mummy. Uh, he had a copper axe and all sorts of uh, other paraphernalia of the late Neolithic. Um, so he was one of the, the first farmers in Europe. He was there, you know, within a, a few thousand years of the, the spread of farming out of the Near East and into Europe. And this is just uh, this is just a little sort of montage of um, some of the work that we that we we did on on the Iceman. Um, a while ago now, sort of this is like about 12 years ago or so, uh, one of the students from when I was working at Leeds who um, who used uh, what's called next generation, an early an early case of next generation sequencing to, to look at um, ancient DNA. And this is what's really taken off in the last in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and just to give you an idea of um, the changes that that's made, when I first looked at the Iceman in 1994. Um, we looked at about three or four hundred base pairs of his DNA, a very small fragment. In 2008, in the work that I just showed pictures of there, um, we looked at the whole mitochondrial DNA, which is about 16,500 bases, so the bases of the A's, T's, C's and G's that make up the, the DNA code. And only four years after that, uh, a group published the whole genome of the Iceman. So the whole, his whole genome, three, three, three thousand two hundred million base pairs, or three, three point two billion base pairs, um, at the. So basically, his whole variation. Um, and at the time, that was um, really, um, you know, one of the first human genomes that was actually that was actually available. Um, and there is there are two points that I'm I'm going to make from that. Uh, one is uh, that the 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 picture that we got from that was very puzzling at the time because we didn't know a huge huge amount about um, human variation, ancient or modern, uh, in in 2012. And it turned out that he looked astonishingly similar to modern day Sardinians, almost identical. So this was a very curious question. So that's something I'll come back to. Um, but the other point that I wanted to make is the scale of the change um, that's that's taken place really just over the last 10, 10 or 10 years or so, at least for our group here. So our sequencing costs have gone from more than 100 pounds to do a, a whole mitochondrial genome sequence in 2015 to suddenly when we went over to next generation sequencing more like 10 or 15 pounds for the whole mitochondrial genome it's gone up a little bit a bit, little bit again since um and but now in 2022 over the last couple of years we've been sequencing whole human genomes so modern human genomes but we've been se sequencing whole human genomes for less than 500 pounds per genome so we send them to um we send them to China and they sequence them for us and um, we can get, you know, a batch of 50 genome sequences. We've been looking at um, people from New Guinea and, and uh, Aboriginal Australians over the last couple of years, and um, we can do that for less than 500 pounds an individual. So that's had two massive impacts on the kind of work that I do. The first is in genomics generally. So we've gone from the little bits of short fragments of a few hundred base pairs of DNA um, to a set of what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms or short tandem repeats, just looking at, at um, various variants across the genome to looking at the whole genome now um, in, in the last few years. And, but at the same time, we've gone um, it's also made a massive difference to the study of ancient DNA. And this is something 
if you watch the news, you might be aware of because we have papers coming out every two or three weeks in nature um, on some major new discovery. Um, in so paleogenetics is you know what we call ancient DNA work. Um, and again, we've gone from um, short stretches of mitochondrial DNA to whole genomes in the space of a few years. And um, and in fact, we've gone um, even as early as 2010. I still remember this very vividly when the uh, the first draft sequence of Neanderthal genome was published, and I I, I was teaching it in Leeds in in 2010. Um, and um, at that point, I think there were literally only five modern human genomes, and yet we already had a Neanderthal genome. And there was a point at which we seemed to be getting more ancient whole genomes than modern whole genomes, although of course that's changed now. So what I'm going to do now after that sort of quick overview is I'm going to introduce you to what we've learned about European populations and then what we've learned about um, prehistoric Britain uh, on the back of that. So <clears throat> this is um, a portrait uh, as a portrait of the genomes of modern Europeans and modern Near Easterners. And there are two there are two basic patterns here going on. Um, so we have what we call um, so a Klein is a genetic gradient um, and we have two Kleins. We have one which goes from the Caucasus south through the Near East and down into Arabia. And then we have another distinct one um, which is across Europe um, and with a, the exception of a few outliers and then Sardinia is indeed one of those, um, you um, you might notice that because this was something that was quite striking very early on when people started looking in su sufficient detail at these patterns, um, that when you look at, this is not quite the whole genome, but look at a very high fraction of the whole genomes and these um, these are, I should have said, but these are spread out in what's called a principal components analysis. So they're spread out in two dimensions. Um, every dot is an individual or an individual's genome, strictly speaking. Um, so we can see how similar they all are to each other and they're sort of color coded for different populations. So you will probably won't be able to read that, but hopefully you can get a sense of the idea that um, here we have something that looks rather nicely similar to a map of Europe. So we've got Southern Europe here from Spain across to Greece. Then we've come up through the Balkans. We've got Central Europe here, Britain here, and then we're going across Northern Europe over here. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so we have that sort of very, very distinctive pattern, which we've known about for more than 10 years now. Um, but what we've had for much less time is um, is, been, is the ability to superimpose ancient DNA samples on top of that. And what we've learned, uh, what we've learned is that, um, is that um, uh, there are, the this pattern that we see across Europe is, is that sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry. Apologies. I'm getting a bit distracted by by the chat coming up in front of me. Um, um, we have this sort of pattern uh, which has been formed by three different, three distinct ancestral populations that we can see sort of at these three poles. So I put um, I've put these three ancestral populations in. Um, and and uh, in different colours here. So we have uh, Mesolithic Europeans. So Mesolithic was the hunter-gatherer populations that lived before farming spread into Europe, and these individuals here are Mesolithic hunter-gatherers from Western Europe. Then over here on the right hand, I don't know whether you can 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 there somebody tell me whether you can actually see my my cursor, my pointer or not? Yes, um, I can. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So on the right hand side, thanks. Um, on the right hand side. Um, down here, um, we've got um, the Mesolithic Near East, so the Levant, the Syria, Palestine, uh, Israel region um, down here, and then the Neolithic of that region very close to it there. So um, this is the region where farming um, developed in the western part of the Fertile Crescent, which is here, over here. So I've, I've put um, I've put the hunter gatherers over here for Europe, um, the ancestors of the the first farmers over here, and then we have another group of farmers 
here over towards Iran and spreading up into the Caucasus, which are here on the top right hand here. So these, there's not many of these individuals because those samples are quite old and quite rare. So they're all mostly more than nine or 10,000 years old. Um, but then what you can see subsequently is that, so we have the European, the modern Europeans grayed out here, but we have, um, we have early farming populations in Europe here um, over, slightly shifted over from, so there's somewhere between the hunter-gatherers in Europe and the farmers in the Near East. So these are the early farmers spreading in Europe seven or 8,000 years ago. And then what we have up here is Bronze Age and modern Europeans. So further up here, we have up towards this area, we have Bronze Age populations from Eastern Europe. Um, and we've got this, and that's sort of a complication to the story that I'll, that I'll come back to in a, minute, in a minute. But we have this sort of combination of these three poles of variation, these three ancestral gene pools coming together. And incidentally, um, we have, um, you can see here that the early farmers, they don't really fall onto um, modern Europeans very much, but they do for, except for the case of Sardinia. So the Sardinians are greyed out there, but hopefully you can see that the early farmers in Europe um, are more or less on top of the Sardinians there. And that is why the Iceman looks like a Sardinian. It's nothing particular about him, but it's the fact that the early the early farmers who, who were spreading through Europe and lived in Europe for the next few thousand years um, looked very much like Sardinians today. So in a way, Sardinians are a bit like a kind of living fossil of those populations who lived about seven or eight thousand years ago. Um, there's another way of looking at this, and that is um, quite a different way where we display the variation in these kind of bar charts. So these 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 bars are lots and lots of individuals and then they're divided up into groups of, of populations here. Um, and so if you imagine um, that they're, they're very thin, so you might just about be able to make out that there are individual bars there and they are color coded for different source populations. So the um, the red ones are African there actually because we've got some North Africans on the left hand side. But um, <clears throat> um, here we have, I can't read this because it's too small, <laughs> but um, over here, these are basically Europeans. And you can see that they, in those populations, this cluster one predominates and I've labeled them one, two and three. Those are the three poles of the, the variation um, because on, on almost every bar chart that you've got or admixture plots as we call them, um, they're colored differently, which is slightly annoying, but can't do anything about. Um, so we have cluster one here in Europeans, but we also have these two other clusters as well. So cluster two is the Near Eastern cluster and it's more common in the Near East now. And cluster three is the one that comes from Iran and the Caucasus which um, is now present in almost all populations, but not in Sardinians and Basques, or much less in Sardinians and Basques, as you can see in the middle there. And when you look at the ancient DNA, which is the really exciting part on the right hand side, you can see that the hunter gatherers in living in Europe were entirely cluster one until um, farming spread in from the Near East about 9,000 years ago. And then when farming did spread, those populations, which are these ones up here, were a mixture of, um, there isn't a separate thing for that, but um, they're a mixture of a wholly orange population, which was what they looked like in um, in the early Near East, and with a bit of um, combined, combined in hunter-gatherers, which is the, the blue there. Um, which has been sort of, you know, as they've assimilated and the Mesonethic hunter gatherer populations as they spread across Europe. So that second cluster um, has then partially replaced populations across Europe as it comes across. The really interesting thing is that the third cluster, which is green in this one, and it's a different shade of green in this one along here, um, is the the cluster from the Caucasus and, the, and ultimately from 
the the populations of Iran 10,000 years ago. Um, that cluster only comes into Europe after 5,000 years ago. So it comes in right at the end of the Neolithic, beginning of the Bronze Age. And these are the bell beaker and corded ware populations that, that you see here, um, which are suddenly a combination of all three clusters there. And that starts about 4,800 years ago or 2800 BC in Europe. And the source of that cluster does, isn't exactly Iran, um, but it seems to be because we're getting a lot of the blue coming back in as well, the second, the, the original first cluster. It seems to be a population that was a mixture of that cluster three and cluster one. And the, com the population that matches that best is a, bron a very early Bronze Age steppe population called the Yamnaya or the Pit Grave culture, who lived around the Black Sea 5,000 years ago. And we think, and linguists have um, you know, been suggesting this for decades and decades, that they uh, were the first people to bring the Indo-European languages into Europe as well. So they expanded from this region here, a bit north of the Black Sea and over and over across north of the Caucasus and the Caspian, over a very vast area after about 5,300 years ago. Um, and they were a mixture of um, people who were coming in across the Caucasus, ultimately from Iran, and the hunter-gatherer populations that lived in this region and adopted pastoralism. So they domesticated the horse and they um, they uh, they 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 started they made use of the wheel basically so they had the horse they had the wheel and they had Indo-European languages and they spread very dramatically after about 5,000 to 300 years ago and they led to the formation of an, another culture called good corded ware over here by mixing with European farmers and that corded ware culture spread rapidly across Europe after 4,800 years ago. So this is the, the the third group here, and a, a figure here is sort of very <laughs> rather crudely showing that. Um, so the corded ware had these beakers, um, and they they then mixed with, again mixed with farmers in Central Europe, um, to form another um, slightly less. Um, pastoralist culture called the bell beakers who are more of a mixed pastoralist farming culture in central Europe and the bell beakers themselves then expanded very uh, those people then you may have heard people of, often have heard of the beaker folk from times at school at least people my age um, and um, they um, they expanded very dramatically across the whole of western and central and back into eastern Europe including into Britain at about 4,500 years ago, or two and a half thousand years BC. And these are beakers that, um, the, the kind that spread into Europe. So then we have this extraordinary situation that was just revealed um, just less than five years ago um, in a, a, another major paper in Nature, where um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the, there was a huge transformation in the population structure of Britain. So that had already happened once. It happened about 6,000 years ago when farming came to Britain and the, the local hunter-gatherer population was all but wiped out by the people who came in uh, with the farmers who crossed the English Channel. Um, but it happened, and the, but if you look at the, the genetic composition in this principal components analysis of the farmers um, who are down here um, and um, the the Bronze Age people and the people in the beakers they started off for a couple of hundred years with with copper and then they then they adopted bronze and bronze rapidly spread over the whole of Europe after about 4,200 years ago or so um, those people are further up here and they're more or less on top of modern British and modern Central European populations there. Um, so there's been a big change between the population of Britain um, 6,000 years ago and 5,000 years ago, a huge change that took place about um, 4,500 years ago, just about the time that Stonehenge was being completed, in fact. So the exact relationship between these people in Stonehenge and the previous people in Stonehenge is 
um, quite intriguing given the fact that um, there was a very large replacement which is shown in this slide here. So I, I don't like the term replacement particularly, it wasn't a complete replacement, but it was quite striking. So if you look, for example, here's the admixture plot. Um, here the, the red is the cluster one, the hunter-gatherer cluster. Uh, the blue is the Neolithic farming cluster and the the green is the is the pastoralist cluster and you can see here Neolithic Britain followed by here um, Beaker and Bronze Age Britain and you can see that that is almost identical to the pattern across um, Beaker and Bronze Age Europe which are over here to the left and um, here again you have um, if you model that as two, two separate populations, you've got here you have the Neolithic population, here you have the Bronze Age population. There is some Neolithic coming through into the Bronze Age, but not, not an awful lot. And if you look down the right hand side, I don't know whether you can really see that, I can't really see it, but um, you've got Y chromosome lineages down the, the male the male line of descent down the right hand side here, um, labelled with different different applicant different cluster names basically and you can see that the the blue ones again are the ones that were found in the neolithic and the majority of them are different when you get to the bronze age and they're they're a different cluster and if you look at overall the fraction um not of not just of um, continental ancestry, which is like 90% or something in Britain after this um, influx of people, but just literally of steppe ancestry. So people right going right the way back to the Russian steppe, then it's it's almost 50% across much of um, at least Eastern Britain sampled here and, and similar for Central and Northern Europe as well. So, and you get the same sort of pattern in the Y chromosome. This is a tree uh, a phylogenetic or genealogical tree of modern Y chromosomes. And you can see these are, the, this is the Neolithic cluster, which is rather dwindled today. We're going right the way back to Africa in this tree. So this, these are some of the European clusters. And again, this is this is one that's spread across Scandinavia, but this is one, uh, this is the one that originates, or rather two, because there's several clusters here, um, that originated in Eastern Europe and only, and again, just like that, um, that genome-wide cluster that we, that ancestral gene pool, it was accompanied by a, a, a set of Y chromosome variants that almost replaced um, the existing Y chromosomes in Europe. Uh, that we call the new ones, mainly R1B, but also R1A, and they replace replace the I2 lineages that were previously present in Europe. So, and in fact, this is um, not just a local phenomenon. This is a massive continental scale phenomenon. So those Y chromosomes and that genome Y cluster spread not only west into Europe, but east into Central Asia as well, um, and led to the formation of the Central Asian Bronze Age, which um, the development of the chariot. The chariot evolved in Central Asia and spread, spread back through into um, ancient Greece and into Europe. Um, uh, because, and, um, and also, we had the spread of um, these groups of people into India, uh, what the Indian subcontinent, by about three and a half thousand years ago, the middle or late Bronze Age of India, replacing the, again, the agricultural civilization that was established in, in India um, earlier on. And um, again, that, that sort of would explain the really rather peculiar distribution of Indo-European languages. So. They're called Indo-European for a reason. The languages that we speak, English, but also um, most of the other languages of Europe, Greek, Italian, Polish, and so on, um, they're all spoken across this area. Then there's a big gap where uh, around the Middle East, there's a lot of different languages, like the Semitic languages. And then across Central Asia, uh, we now have Turkish languages because there's been subsequent invasions of um, populations from East Asia across there, coming in as far as Turkey. But in India, we still have much of the population speaking Indo-European languages. Um, most many, many of them evolved from Sanskrit that existed about three and a half thousand years ago. Um, so we and Sanskrit and, and indeed ancient Persian, um, where you have sort of Iran, uh, because these populations not only moved into India, but they also moved into Iran as well. Um, so you've got a branch of the 
the family that goes into India and Iran, and then you have this other branch that goes into Europe. So a lot of long standing questions are being resolved here. Um, OK, so uh, a quick addendum to that that was just just came out at the end. Uh, well, early this year um, and because especially because we're talking about Britain. So we have this huge influx of populations um, at the beginning of the Bronze Age in Britain, uh, more or less um, taking over from the the earlier farming populations and the even earlier hunter gatherer populations that were in Britain after the Ice Age. Um, but there was a further, it seems that there was a further influx um, that came in from France, at least into southern and eastern Britain, about um, uh, a, a thousand or two thousand years later, um, towards the end of the Bronze Age, the late middle to late Bronze Age. Um, so this has been detected by an increase in the farming component in English and Welsh populations. Um, so the farming fraction, the cluster two genome wide ancestry component um, is uh, higher in um, Western continental Europe, France and Spain, and it becomes higher in England. But interestingly enough, um, so here you see it increasing in England and Wales, but not as it happens much in, in Scotland by comparison um, as you as you go through the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. And it may be that it wasn't those first um, beaker populations that brought the Celtic languages, which are Brit um, were Britain's indigenous languages when the Romans came. Um, uh, but rather this second wave of uh, immigration that came in from France. Um, in the later Bronze Age. And there you see this wave of, this is a rather complicated slide, but you see this sort of increase in that ancestry, um, especially at this in this period during the later Bronze Age, but you see various um, streams of immigration coming in during, during the course of the Bronze Age. These, these are outliers, so that again, these are individual ancestries of individual people. Um, and um, you can see that the this is a plot of the num of the fraction of ancestries. So that uh, sorry, the the fraction of outliers and the outliers we assume are, are immigrant people who are coming in with rather different genomes from the continent, and the number of those falls down during the Iron Age. So you get immigration again during the Bronze Age, and then dropping off and more isolation during the Iron Age after about 700 or 800 BC. So a little you can learn a bit more um, by uh, by looking at the uh, what we call the uniparental markers. So I and my colleagues have um, spent most of our careers working on mitochondrial DNA, which is just inherited down the female line of descent and um, also on, to some extent on the Y chromosome, which is um, follows the male line of descent. And <clears throat> um, and if you look at these uh, separately, uh, which has, hasn't really been done a great deal with um, a lot of these answers, these these analyses, which have just looked at the whole genome, um, because you can can look at the whole genome these days, um, then you can see some interesting patterns. So I've already mentioned the fact that you get this very um, extreme replacement of Y chromosomes across Europe when the the Amnaya related corded ware and bell beaker populations come in um, four and a half to five thousand years ago. Um, but what I've done here is I've looked at the so there's more than, across Western Europe, more than 90 percent of the male lineage is um, comes from the Russian steppe. Um, but if you look at the female side, then if you look at the corded ware, corded ware populations, these populations in Central Europe, then what I've done here is I've just I've just color coded them for sort of Yamnaya is 100% orange and basic European Neolithic, which I've taken as the 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 Copper Age populations from Iberia, um, which was still basically um, uh, farming populations. Um, I've put those in blue so you can see the fraction of the European farmer lineages and the incoming lineages on the female line of descent here. And you can see that in the corded ware, they're about half and half. The corded ware in Russia, they're very similar because um, the corded ware spread off into Russia as well as into Central Europe. But if you look at the bell beakers in Central Europe, you see a, a sudden jump in the 
the blue fraction, which is the European Neolithic ancestry. Again, just looking at the female side, not in the males. And then if you look in Northwest Europe, so France and Britain, you see another jump. Um, so at every stage, um, you seem to be getting um, the assimilation of local women, but not local men. So there's an interesting process going on here, which has often been characterized as rampaging warrior males sort of storming across Europe and burning everything. And you had pictures on the front of new scientists of them burning Stonehenge and so on. Um, but um, in actual fact, it might have been um, a much more complex process of that. So firstly, we we know that um, from this that we can see that the steppe people were bringing women with them. So I said, I mean, they were they were families uh, that were coming. Um, so there was there were equal numbers of men and women um, dispersing. And but at the same time, what they were doing was recruiting women, but not men from the local populations as they spread west as well. And this was probably also the case as they spread into Central Asia and, and India as well and Iran. Um, and so the outcome of that is that in Britain, most of the male ancestry derives from the steppe, but most of the female ancestry derives from Western European um, farmers and hunter gatherers. Although not so much from Britain itself, but mainly assimilated in um, in Northwest Europe, in um, France, Germany and Holland, I guess. So now finally on to Britain itself, and I'm going to say, I mean, um, uh, as one one particular particularly focused project where we found what we think is a slight exception to this overall pattern. So, and that's by looking at Orkney. And we looked at Orkney obviously because Orkney is very famous for its Neolithic. Um, and there was some Neolithic, uh, there were some Neolithic genomes available from this big study that had been done previously. So Orkney's up here. Um, we were looking right on the edge of Orkney on Westray um, at a site, uh, but not an Neolithic site, a Bronze Age site called the Lynx of Nortland, um, and uh, a few samples as well from an Iron Age site called the Nerski. Um, so we looked at um, an equal number of um, Bronze Age um, samples to the uh, the the number of Neolithic samples that have already been published to see whether you say see, see this same pattern in Orkney as you see elsewhere because Orkney was as you probably know very special um, it has all these standing stones it's been argued that Orkney may have been the center of a, a sort of religious cultic center in the Neolithic it was very influential the pottery from Orkney spread across Britain and Ireland so they were exporting a lot of um, goods and probably ideas as well and it may have even been the um, the the megaliths in Orkney um, may have the stone circles and so on may have even been the inspiration for Stonehenge. So Orkney's a, a major place in the Neolithic, and it's always been thought, uh, just to mention, um, that um, that these are the the, the PhD students who worked on on this particular project. Again, working on this Leverhulme project that we had. Um, Bronze Age Orkney's always been seen more as a time of of recession. So you know, not much going on basically in the Bronze Age. Um, they the idea is that it became isolated um, from the rest of the world and, and went into decline. Um, but on the other hand, it hasn't really been very well studied. And we got in touch with uh, a pair of archaeologists called Hazelmore and Graham Wilson, who'd been working at the Licks of Northland, um, who'd excavated a Bronze Age cemetery, quite a large Bronze Age cemetery. And they'd also worked on the Neolithic. They found amazing things from the Neolithic, like this, um, this is called uh, uh, the Orkney Venus or the wife of Westray. So the things like this have never been found in Britain before, but they are um, small figurines. Um, again, probably uh, you know some kind of uh, Neolithic goddess or something like that. Um, but um, you know they wanted to also know what was going on in the Bronze Age as well. Um, and when we look at the Orkney Bronze Age, we look at the genome-wide patterns. Then we see that they fit in. Um, pretty much perfectly with what's going on in the rest of Britain and Europe. Um, so these are this these are our Orkney samples here, um, falling on top of the the other European Bronze Age and Iron Age samples. Um, there is one Neolithic sample that we did from Scotland as well, falling with the other Neolithic samples from Britain and Europe. Um, so it looked very much as if this replacement process. 
um, that took place in the Bronze Age was happening in Orkney too, and perhaps wasn't quite so um, isolated and insular as as people, well, archaeologists had really thought. And if you look at this again from the point of view of these admixture plots, hopefully you can see here the individuals a bit more clearly because there's fewer on here. Um, then if we compare, these are British Bronze Age, um, these are European Bronze Age, these are British um, British hunter-gatherers and uh, British Neolithic, um, and here is the Orkney Neolithic with the two components, the, the one and the two, the, uh, the hunter-gatherer and the farmer cluster, and you can see that you have this third cluster, which is now blue, I'm afraid, um, just as you do in the rest of Britain and Europe. Um, so you can get this um, massive influx of new lineages coming in um, uh, with the Bronze Age in Orkney, just as you do elsewhere. However, again, if you look at the, um, the mitochondrial DNA in the Y chromosome, then you see something rather different. Um, so what we find, this is a little mini tree of Orkney Y chromosomes in the context of the other, uh, the other um, lineages on the same branch of the Y chromosome tree. And you'll notice that these are part of the I2A cluster, the one I said earlier was Neolithic, rather than the R1B, that big cluster that came sweeping across Europe from the Black Sea. Um, so unlike other other Bronze Age Europeans, um, the where the, the male lineages were more or less replaced by lineages from the Russian steppe. Most of the male lineages in, so eight out of nine of the male lineages that we that we um, sampled from Bronze Age Orkney um, actually um, retained the Neolithic signature. They were part of that Neolithic pattern. And if you look at those there in the context, so there's our eight Bronze Age ones, all of the other members of this lineage are Neolithic and they form this sort of arc around Western Europe, um, which maps the basically the, the Neolithic expansion out of Southwest Europe and into Northern Europe. Um, so they are still reflecting that Neolithic picture. They haven't they haven't been replaced. Um, so there was large scale immigration into Orkney during the Bronze Age. And in fact, um, most of the Neolithic genomes were replaced within quite a sh short time, with certainly within a thousand years. Um, but this immigration was not mainly males, it was mainly females. And we haven't seen this pattern anywhere else in the world. So it was women who were coming in and the men had descended from the, the, the farming males who had been there already. So we think this is probably the result of a pattern that had been established during the Neolithic of the um, the 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 males in in Orkney, which you know remember was very powerful and very influential, um, recruiting their marriage partners from the mainland, which is quite a common uh, later on was quite a common pattern to um, recruit marriage um, women marriage partners from from further afield. And for the men to stay, um, to stay put, basically, and so perhaps that reflects the stability of this, the the system that had developed during Neolithic Orkney, um, and allowed the the men to persist there uh, longer than than they did um, in the rest of Europe. Although actually by the Iron Age, it looked as if um, those lineages were being gradually replaced by the Euro the the Bronze Age lineages. So just one little extra um, thing to to round to round off with, um, uh, which is um, something that we've been involved with just very recently, which is uh, currently um, being assessed at Nature, which is um, what went on later on in the medieval period, and in particular, which um, what happened with the Anglo-Saxons. So again, you know, the, the question of, so obviously we don't speak Celtic languages anymore in Britain, and we don't speak Latin, we, we speak English. Um, that came in about after 500 AD uh, with, um, migrants from northern Germany uh, mainly, but um, the question has always been, was that a small number of elite males or was it, uh, you know, warrior war bands or was it um, a large scale settlement? And um, what this um, genome analysis shows here um, is that the pattern of ancestry, which is divided here, the blue ones are the indigenous um, British ancestry and the red ones are continental uh, German, Dutch and 
Danish and Scandinavian ancestry, basically. Um, you can see quite a large scale replacement. We're looking at Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, of course, here. We're not really looking at what's going on in Wales or Scotland, but you can see a large replacement there in Eastern England. Um, and you can see that here as well. This is a, uh, the, the uh, uh, this is a plot of 100% continental ancestry against 100% local ancestry. This is coming through the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Roman period, where you start to get a bit more diversity, and then the Saxon period here, um, right across here, where you see a much bigger range, including a lot of a lot of individuals, in fact, who are direct migrants or descendants of migrants with 100% ancestry from um, from from the continent. With just one exception here, which is um, a cemetery that that we've been working on, which is a, a post Roman cemetery rather than a Saxon cemetery. And you can see there that there's much less in, um, impact from the, the Saxon migrations. So I, um, I'll just I'll summarize all that because there's a lot there and then I'm and then I'm done basically. Um, so um, there's been uh, as as um, uh, what's what's really astonishing to all of us is how fast this has all happened. So this has really just happened, especially in the last 10 years. A lot of this stuff that I've been talking about has really just happened in the last few years. Um, the picture for Britain has been completely transformed in the last five years, and it's solved questions that, you know, we've been asking for centuries, really. Um, so. <clears throat> And it's all down to next generation sequencing techniques, basically sort of this advance in sequencing technology. So Britain and um, in fact, the whole of Europe was resettled multiple times during the last 10,000 years. So firstly, by Neolithic farmers spreading out to the Near East, then by Bronze Age pastoralists from the Black Sea. And then later again, um, Britain was uh, uh, experienced more settlement from France in the later Bronze Age and then uh, further uh, from a little bit further east in Holland and, Den and Holland and Germany and Denmark in the Saxon period and that went straight on carried on more or less continuously right into the Viking period where um, the the orientation moves slightly to the north in Denmark and, and Scandinavia. In both of the earlier cases, um, as, I, as I mentioned, it was families that were spreading. Um, but in the second wave, the pastoralist wave, they were more male dominated in the sense that they were bringing in women from the local populations, from the farming populations, but not men, basically. So the men were either, we don't know what happened to the men, basically, but they didn't they didn't pass on many of their genes. Um, the um, those pastoralists spread the Indo-European languages across Europe, almost certainly, um, but the Celtic languages may not have come in in that first wave with the Beaker people, but may have come in with that later wave from France in the later Bronze Age. So in Orkney, the situation was slightly different. Um, the population was largely replaced, but the male lineage has lasted for much longer, probably up until the Iron Age. Um, Eastern Britain experienced then further major immigration and language change over to English with Old English with the early medieval period about 1500 years ago, so about 500 AD to well, about 450 to 600, 700 AD um, with Germanic speakers and the formation of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The process of immigration carried on into the Iron Age. And as I was writing this summary, um, it occurred to me that what's quite striking then for the long term picture of Britain over the last 10,000 years is that um, Britain as an island, even Orkney as an island, were, weren't remotely insular over this time at all, haven't been isolated from the continent for the past 10,000 years whatsoever. In fact, um, you can contrast with that, that with Sardinia, where um, there's been much more apparent resistance to to people coming in and uh, replacing the population but um, if anything the pic um, the picture on for Britain on even right on the on the edge of Europe as it's often described seems to have led led it to be being more open to immigration from a, from the continent than um, uh, than other parts of, of the world so um, I'll finish there I'll just um, I'll just uh, put on some acknowledgements. Um, so we've been supported mainly for this stuff by the uh, this um, grant that Laura mentioned from the Levy Hume Trust, for which we've been uh, 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 extremely grateful. And um, 
that project is now just just finally coming to end. So there's been 15 PhD students come out of that. Um, and just a few acknowledgements, which you probably won't be able to read, but not not everybody is is acknowledged on here. But those are the people who are involved with the Orkney project, and also um, some of the people who are involved with the uh, uh, the uh, the European Bronze Age project as well. Um, so there, I'm, and thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you, Martin. That was that was really interesting. Um, I certainly learned a lot. So uh, please type your questions into the chat if you have any questions. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'll start by asking uh, a couple myself, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so my first question to you is you talked about sort of it was about 30 years ago that that science evolved enough to be able to to help you to to start to obtain all this data and it, and it's really advanced a lot, especially like you said in the last few years. Do you feel now that science is, is far enough progressed that you, you have what you need to be able to find out the information. It's just a case of, of doing a, a lot more analysis on a lot more samples. Or do you think there's still um, breakthroughs to be made in the scientific side, which would help you understand things better? Yeah, it's a good question. I I, um, I think in my area, I'm kind of really happy with, with, with the way things are. I mean, um, it's, uh, we, you know, when we wrote that Leverhulme grant, we didn't expect to be doing this stuff at all. I think we mentioned that we might do one whole genome or something like that. You know, I mean, um, we, it's um, it's just, it's moved so fast, so quickly. And we can now, I mean, we are sequencing, like I said, we're sequencing whole genomes from modern people. We're getting a pretty good representation of whole genomes from, you know, from people going back thousands and thousands of years. Um, there are people in the world sequencing, um, you know, archaic humans going back, I think, at least 400,000 years. And um, I mean, certainly, the, you know, it would be nice to go further back and it, we would hope that we would be able to. Also, there are parts of the world that haven't, you know, that still haven't really yielded um, any data. So one of the, the big um, sort of you know, the tropics generally. Um, but that said, there's been quite a lot of data coming out from Africa just in the last two or three years. Um, India is still a bit of a gulf. So um, um, you want, might hope that there might be improvements in recovery, but it might just be that that there's no DNA. But you you don't want to say that anymore. I mean, <laughs> of course, and it would be nice to have dinosaurs, obviously, um, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have thought any of this was going to happen five or ten years ago. So you never know. Hmm. Um, so you've still got lots, lots to do. Yeah, yeah, there's still <laughs> lots to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, my second question was about the you talked about linguistics as well. So do you feel that your science helps uh, linguists understand where where the languages have come from and how they've moved or do you think that the linguistics helps you understand what's going on with the science you know is it does it work both ways do you talk to each other quite a lot about the about the sort of movement of people uh yeah so we talked to some there's not historical linguistics is not a very big subject so it's a very small part of linguistics and linguistics is not that big a subject either um so there's not that many people to talk to but we talk to a few basically and we work very closely with with one celtic linguist um on a lot of this stuff and uh, we've talked to a few others so um we don't have the kind of big network of links that we have with archaeologists because um because there just aren't so many people to interact with um it's a really niche area um but I, which is a shame because it's so interesting i don't know really why that's why that is but it it's just never really um grown massively um because it's something that i'm sure you know everybody's interested in but it doesn't seem to be very well supported in the universities um but um yeah i think it just it works both ways and we tr we work together and um uh, think the more you can do that, the more you can learn, really. And I suppose your um, scientific investigations can take you back a lot further, probably than than sort of linguistics or records of, yeah. of those sorts of things would take you anyway, wouldn't they? I suppose you can you can work because you're talking you can you can look back thousands and thousands of years, can't you? And yeah. in, into what's so, been happening. Yeah, I mean, um, so obviously texts don't go back more than about 5,000 years, but um, historical linguists argue that they can reconstruct um, languages back further than that, but not many of them would 
would would claim to be able to go back more than about seven or eight thousand years or so. Some do, and it is possible that some languages might go back fifteen thousand years or something like that in Africa, for example. But um, but um, yeah, it's a different kind of time depth, really. That so you can about. you can go in, you can go fair, a lot further back. Than, yeah. Than, yeah. Yeah. I mean, depending on what you look at, then we can, in theory, we can go back to the origins of life. So, and there are people, you know, as you know, there are people at Huddersfield who are going back a hell of a long way, uh, much further than we do. Yeah. Um, but a lot of that, again, is it's not all ancient DNA because DNA doesn't mostly survive. Doesn't not an awful lot of DNA survive. Well, not much DNA survives beyond a million years or so. Um, so a lot of that, again, is inferences from the variation in modern, um, you know, animal populations, plant populations, whatever. And I suppose a, a lot of the research focuses on specific areas as well. So sort of something like Egyptian mummies or something. I guess there's a lot of interest in in uh, sort of understanding the DNA of what's going on around those sorts of groups of people. Is there more interest in some groups of people than than others? Um, I'm not sure. Um, Egyptian mummies have been a bit of a funny one because I think there was a lot of, you know, slightly dubious attempts to do that because of the interest sort of which might have slightly dissipated the enthusiasm for it a little bit. But there has been work on on that. Um, and, you know, but there are also there are also been claims that people aren't always able to assess very well or don't make an awful lot of sense so um so it's been a bit of a funny area the egyptian mummies but mm. um yeah i suppose i think the main bias in the results has been has been europe really because i mean um there are parts of the world like i said india there's almost nothing back beyond the iron age and um there's whole parts you know parts of the world where again like in um in australia for example there's one one sample that might be a few thousand years old which isn't even dated and then apart from that, that i think this that's just about it really hardly anything from new guinea or um yeah the, i mean starting to get stuff from um, china and southeast asia but it's and america but um but yeah it's been really europe that's taken off because um you know because it turned out that um the preservation was better than a lot of places and North um, America, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so John Dean has put a question up. I don't know if you can see it in the chat or I, I can read it to you. I can't um, see it. OK, right. so do you have any data for the routes that the immigration may have taken? Some suggest sea routes with similarity of Atlantic coast populations different to Central Europe. Uh, routes when? Um, so which bit? I mean, there's there's so many different dispersals and some of them might be a bit more clear than others at the moment, I think. Um, so it depends what you're talking about. In the case of the Neolithic, we think that most of the settlement into Britain was from the west, from around the Atlantic or from central France. So it, um, coming in, you know, across the, the channel uh, rather than from a bit further east uh, where a lot, you know, so the central European Neolithic um, did spread into England, but probably wasn't the main element. Um, um, in the case of, I think we have a reasonably good idea how the Beaker people spread in, the, the Beaker people, um, which was probably from Holland, but that, a lot of that comes down to the pottery and the fact that then they sampled those people to look at the, the immigration to Britain. So there's sometimes a bit of a bias in the way that people are looking at the samples. Um, uh, other groups, well, um, I think with the Saxons, it's very hard to discriminate because you had this kind of continuum along the North Sea by that point. So they were all speaking Northwest Germanic languages and um, like English is actually closest to Frisian, which is um, the language that's spoken along the islands, along the coast, and then to Holland, and then to Dutch, I think, and then to, um, you know, the sort of West Germanic languages that they, the ones that, you know, to German basically, but, um, but the, 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 um, the low German rather than the high German. Um, uh, I have another question from Colin who says, could you explain how the short term repeat mutations SNPs are dated? Um, they, they're not dated. Um, so um, dates, uh, date, those, any, any analysis that's done with 
um, SNPs is is not easy to date really. Um, uh, so we would date things using a molecular clock based on you know sort of gradual accumulation of mutations along lineages, and um, you can um, if you're if you're biasing sample with I mean I think you can make the uh, I, I mean the the thing about ancient DNA is that um, a lot of that kind of dating is kind of redundant because we have radiocarbon dates, so we know when we know for example that the third the third this third big third cluster that I, that I said comes from the steppe and comes in into Europe. We know when that comes in because we have radiocarbon dates for the first time that you see it, and you don't see it in any samples before that. Um, when we talk about molecular clock dates with the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, then um, there are several approaches, and we calibrate against. We either as you can estimate the mutation rate from ancient DNA samples by looking at the different divergence, different lineages now, or you can um, just calibrate against the divergence from the chimp, or you can look at the divergence within a particular island, maybe that's been that you know the date of settlement. But that's quite there's not many where we really know for sure <laughs> that, that are actually genuinely interesting. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions. I had one more question I wanted to ask you, which was. Um, you talked about, uh, oh, sorry, Cal Collins added one extra thing in there. So is that dependent on the sample size in, in certain times? No. No? <laughs> um, it's, I always feel a bit nervous saying that because there, there are definitely popular, so maybe there are some methods which do depend on the sample size because I know that I've been accused of, you know, that people, Population geneticists are something sometimes said, oh, this will depend on the sample size. Um, the approaches that we've always used for molecular clock dating don't depend. They're completely what we call phylogenetic. So they're not population genetics methods, which look at the, you know, the, the frequencies of different 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 mutations in a the population. They're based on drawing genealogical trees and then dating parts of the tree by looking at the mutations. They don't depend on population size, no. Okay. Um Oh, Steve, uh, can ancient DNA become degraded over time? Can you validate whether a sample is good? How well preserved would a body need to be to extract the DNA? Yeah, um, so that's another. Yeah, I, I didn't say anything about DNA or how difficult it has been because I started working on DNA when, I, as I mentioned, I, I looked at the ice one in 1993. Um, it was really hard to do ancient DNA then because we would just look at PC, PCR. Ancient DNA is always degraded into very small fragments um, and it's damaged and um, it's very easily contaminated with modern DNA. So there's all sorts of problems with um, with that. But we get around them with next generation sequencing because you can authenticate the samples by looking. So you can actually look at the damage um, that you see in the sequences that you generate and, and quantify that and see whether it looks ancient or not. Just so you can you can um, I don't know whether Steve was saying can you assess that beforehand which is a different question um, but um, I think people who really work on it um, get quite good at looking at the bones and seeing whether they think they're going to work or not and the other thing that's sort of very relevant to that is a discovery that about maybe less than 10 years ago hmm, I can't remember exactly when it was um, that um, the the ear bone is extremely good at retaining DNA. So the densest part of your body is your skull, and the dense part of your skull uh, of your skull is around the ear. Um, what's good called the petrous bone, petrous for rock, because it's like so hard and so dense. And because it's so dense, um, the DNA is um, survives there much better than anywhere else. So you can either look at teeth or you can look at the ear bone, and that's what we. If we possibly can, that's what we do, and that's that's given fantastic recovery. So some of those Orkney samples, which are, um, they are like three and a half thousand, four thousand years old. Um, they um, some of them had like seventy percent, sixty percent, seventy percent DNA, and or something like that. I mean, they go right. Out. Some some of the samples we looked at had nothing or half a percent or something. Um, but we've had some amazing stuff in the you know when we look at those petrous bones. Um, so there's no other questions. I'll finish off with my my one last question, which I wanted to ask, which was the the whole study about the Orkney was that did you did you choose the Orkney Islands knowing that it, it, it would be so interesting or did you did you did you do a proposal for a study where you would once you know you'd started to look around, you would then choose where you were going to focus on it? Which way around did it work? 
Um, it was just because Orkney is like intrinsically interesting. I mean, the Orkney Day, I think, is intrinsically interesting because, you know, in a way, because it's such a major cultural center in, during the, the Neolithic. Um, so, um, and then, but but uh, but then the archaeologists that we the, we met were very interested in looking at the Bronze Age, and it turned out, you know, that actually, you know, nobody knows what's going on in the Bronze Age really, or nobody did. So um, so that turned out to be the more interesting question. And and then in the meantime, when that big British study was published, then that included those original twenty one Auckland Neolithic samples, which they didn't analyze. So I mean, didn't analyze separately as as, as a special project. So we had that already in hand, and um, um, so it sort of built up. From that it, the original idea was just that Orkney is a really interesting place to look at. Um, so we had no idea what was going to happen really. So that's all the questions. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Martin, for giving up your You're time welcome. and delivering such an interesting lecture. I'd also like to thank uh, Steve for all of the behind the scenes work that Steve's you, put Steve. into this evening. <laughs> um, it it's, wouldn't be possible without your help. Um, just to finish up by saying our next public lecture will be in the autumn. And then we're hoping to have another one, um, hopefully before Christmas as well. So we're going to have a summer break before we come back with our next one. Um, thanks once again to Martin and Stephen. Thank you all for uh, attending this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, then then definitely let us know. But thanks again and uh, hopefully see you all again soon. So thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.